It's old. I'm adulting very hard right now. Uh, I was talking to people in my Bible study. I got married eight months ago. I'm buying a house. Um, so adulting very hard. I'm very proud of myself. But um, one thing I've figured out about myself from the last 27 years um, is that uh, I love knowing why people do the things that they do. Um, kind of like their motivation behind the choices they make. I don't think I'm alone in this. It's, it's one of the reasons television is so entertaining, right? Um, one of my personal favorites, The Voice USA. Uh, <laughs> because you get to meet Billy, and Billy's from Virginia, and him and his brother have taken over the family farm. And, but his dream is to be a country star. And so he gets up there, he's like... Country road, take me home. And then they do send him home, and you're sad, right? Because that was Billy's dream. And it's like, okay, we love knowing. We, I'm fascinated by people's motivation to do things and the background that gets them to, to make the decisions that they do. My mom used to tell me to hurry up when I was telling stories because... I would share a lot of the details that to her seemed unimportant, but to me were very important because I wanted to know why the people did the things that they did, right? Um, and a couple of weeks ago, first week of classes, me and a couple of our uh, other, other UCO staff, we were out on campus trying to meet people, and we said, you got to answer a couple questions, we'll give you some free candy, right? What classic carrot stick, right? Um, We're just trying to meet people. One of the questions was, which do you hate more, the University of Michigan or Ohio State? Very interesting study. It was like Ohio State was more hated on the campus of MSU. Can I get a show of hands? Who hates U of M more? Who hates Ohio State more? Wow, fascinating. Personally surprised. Maybe it's because we never send a chance to, against Ohio State. Um, but something helpful, something helpful to realize is if we, don't know, if we don't know the background or the history or the motivation behind U of M versus Michigan State football game, it's just... 40-odd students from a school an hour away playing against 40-odd students at our university that likely you've never met before. Has anyone met one of the football players? From this school, (laughs) MSU. Nice, right. Maybe. Um, But we have such strong emotions. We hate their football team and potentially the tens of thousands of students that are just trying to get a degree. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's a fascinating thing. And we spend money to go see them play, and we yell, and we cheer, and we're happy when they win, and we're sad when we lose. Because the history matters. It actually does matter. And that's sports. We can, you can take it or leave it with sports. But I think this, this applies to a lot of different things. Um, as it happens a few times, because I'm Irish, I get asked, I've been asked the question, why do Irish people hate the English so much? Hilarious question. Well, if you don't, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. There are countries right next to each other. It's like, why wouldn't we get along? People should expect people to be nice. Um, but the story, the history, is that England oppressed Ireland for 800 years, and they tried to eradicate our culture our language, our religion. And when they finally gave us our country back, they kept 25% of it for themselves. Um, Now, it's the year that it is. I don't hate English people um, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, But it is helpful to know that in the context of of a conversation with me or an English person or some questions that one might ask me, um, because it's relevant. I do still really enjoy watching England lose in sports, though. 
especially rugby because they invented it and we're better than them. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that one. Okay, so why am I talking about this? The scripture passage we're looking at today, it's pretty incredible, but to really get the most meaning from it, um, we have to understand the history and background to what's going on. I'm going to be honest, I read way too much preparing for this talk because it was really interesting. I got a little ahead of myself. I read most of a 278-page dissertation from someone in Kansas on uh, centurions in the era of Christ. It was phenomenal. Um, If you want it, I could send it to you. Um, But we're going to look at the history, and I'm going to try and make this fun, okay? I think it will be fun. It's not going to be very long. I've got some fun slides. Um, Are they nice? There we go. All right. So that's the name of the talk. Great. So the passage we're looking at is Acts chapter 10, which is about 30-something A.D., after Christ. Um, But, scooching backwards a little bit, from about 165 B.C. to 37 B.C., Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel, um, and the surrounding area was under the rule of the Maccabean Jews, the Hasmoneans. Um, There we go. The Jewish people, they, the Hasmoneans, they had an agreement with the Romans um, that they could like rule their own little section of land, which was pretty nice. So the Jewish people were able to go to the temple and um, make the sacrifices. They could live the way that they wanted to live because they were ruled by their own people. Um, however, these guys in 67 BC, their brothers... The slide got a little messed up. The guy on the uh, right is Aristobulus II. Um, and Hyrcanus, the guy on the left, he was in power. He was the king and high priest. Um, generally a pretty decent guy. Uh, however, Aristobulus and Hyrcanus both wanted to be the king and high priest, which that's not going to work because you're only, you know, only able to have one of those. So both of them asked the Romans for help and um, General Pompey, not the city that with the volcano, just the general, um, he, they, were, yeah, they decided to fight. Um, and Pompey sided with Hyrcanus II because he was more of a puppet that he could control, which is a terrible reason. But he won. Aristobulus will come back shortly. So things continue somewhat peacefully. Um, and then in 40 BC, Hyrcanus's nephew, Aristobulus's son, oh wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, we missed something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So after, after Pompey and Hyrcanus beat evil brother Aristobulus, he's in power for a while, but his, Hyrcanus's chief advisor is this dude Antipater who's Herod's dad. Herod's the big bad man. Okay, we're going to get to him. So he was his chief advisor. Um, And, yeah, weird neck. Uh, So, okay, then in 40 BC, evil dude, you remember evil dude Aristobulus II? His son, Hyrcanus' nephew, boots boots Hyrcanus (laughs) off the throne. Do you want to see that again? That took a lot of effort, actually. Here we go. Wham! Thank you, thank you, thank you. So the guy in the middle is Antigonus, who is Aristobulus' son. So they, they launch a revolution, and um, Antigonus is king. And so do we remember, we remember it like two seconds ago. So Antipater was Hyrcanus' chief advisor. Herod is the chief advisor's son, who'd risen to political power because of his dad. And um, this happened... Herod freaks out. Oh, hang on. Herod freaks out because he's like, the city's been taken. I'm no longer in control. And he runs to Rome. He's he's like, help, please. Jerusalem's been taken over by bad people. They were not bad people. but And Rome unexpectedly says, you know what? You should be the king of Judea. Herod's like, sweet. So 
Rome gives him an army. And after a war of three years, around 37 BC, um, they win Jerusalem, which is kind of bad because Herod's a bad dude. His name in history is Herod the Great. He's really not so great. Um, So 37 BC, the Hasmonean dynasty ends, followed by the Herodian dynasty because of Herod. Okay? Herod the Great was a bad man. Okay? He was raised a Jew, but was of our descent. He really didn't follow the law of the Jews. He kind of like looked like he did in public. Um, But once he became king, after this war of three years for Jerusalem, he made a massive secret police force. He killed anyone who tried to oppose him. He placed a lackey, like someone who was loyal to him, in the position of high priest. Um, He did these massive building building projects, some of which you can still kind of see today, which is kind of cool, but he did it by enslaving the Jewish people, which is terrible. He killed three of his sons and one his first wife. Terrible. He instituted really harsh taxes for the Jewish people, mostly to fund his little building projects, but also just to kind of like give expensive gifts to powerful people so they could give him cool stuff too. Um, He's also the one that we see, if you know the gospel story, he's the one who's like, Jesus has been foretold. We should kill all the firstborn sons, including his own son. He'd killed all of them. It doesn't make any sense. He's a bad man, okay? History lesson over. You still with me? All right, great. So why did I tell you all this? It's pretty fun. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. The main point is that the Jewish people hated the Romans. When Jesus was born, Herod was in power. The Romans had invaded the Jewish people's homeland. They damaged their temple, which is like the worst no-no. Herod also put up a statue of a a golden eagle, which is like the Roman symbol, right in the middle of the entrance to the temple, which was terrible. Um, They enslaved the Jewish people. They were the occupying force in Jerusalem. Um, We don't see a massive amount of this in the Gospels, because Jesus kind of does his own thing but this is the background that's happening and it continues through jesus's whole ministry um our passage takes place around 35 a.d but the social political climate largely hasn't changed rome is definitely in power herod's son is ruling over jerusalem and judea um and the Jewish people still hate the Romans because they're still treating them really terribly, okay? Nice. The first person we meet in our story is a Roman. And he's not just a Roman. He's a centurion in the Roman army. So, like, the Romans, we hate the Romans. The Roman army is the one who killed a lot of people who have, like, expanded their territory across the known world massively. Centurions were the backbone of the Roman army. They were stationed in specific places to, like, maintain order, collect taxes, keep the peace, sometimes with violence. Um, They kind of were like judges, too. If you had, like, a dispute, the centurion would be like, he's right, kill the other person. Um, They... The, the name centurion means they led 100 soldiers. But if you were like a really good centurion, you could be like the head honcho in a legion, which means you had like 4,000 soldiers under you at once. That is the person we meet today, Cornelius. Yep. Cornelius the centurion. Okay. We have finally gotten to our scripture passages, guys. All right, Acts 10. First one, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Makes sense. Rome is in Italy. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Okay, strange. Because we hate the Romans, right? Immediately, Cornelius sets apart 
our expectation of what a Roman centurion should be like. Romans had pagan gods. They were not a part of God's people. And it says Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with all his household, was generous to people in need, and prayed. Interesting. Okay. It was very rare for someone in the Roman army, especially a centurion, to to follow the Jewish way of life, to even to pray to God, because that was not the religion of the country. Um, okay, moving on. Cornelius has a vision of an angel telling him that his prayers had been answered and to send people to go get Peter and bring him back to his place at Caesarea. Kind of interesting. The Lord is answering the prayers of a Roman centurion. Okay. Then Peter, so Peter was one of the Jesus' apostles. Um, he's the one who denies the Lord three times. And then, yeah, we know who Peter is. Then, so the passage shifts to Peter. Peter's hungry. He sits down to eat. It falls into a trance. I don't know if you've ever been that hungry. I've gotten very hungry, but not to that point. Um, and he has a vision. This one's not on your slides. The heavens opened, and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And a voice came to him a second time, While God has made clean, do not call common. Okay, somewhat strange vision eat the unclean animals. But what this is doing is it's speaking to what God is orchestrating in the mission of the church at this point. Um, He saw this vision three times. So it was clearly important. The Jews could not eat things that were unclean. Some people thought they worshipped pigs because they didn't eat pork because pigs were unclean. It was the Romans thought they, they called them pig worshippers which is a strange name for the Jewish people, but that was the pigs were unclean. So Peter's saying, I've never eaten anything unclean because it was part of the law. He was trying to be a holy person. And by Jewish law, was doing a good job because he wasn't eating anything unclean. And God is telling him to just directly break the law that he's followed since he was a child and not consider anything unclean. Okay, Kind of strange. While Peter was pondering the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise, go down, and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So these are Cornelius's men. They found Peter, they tell him why they're there, and he accepts to go with them. This is, this is a bigger deal than we might think. It's like, oh yeah, they found him. He's going to go with them because the Holy Spirit told him to you. Um, A Jew entering the home of a Gentile, which is just anyone who's not a Jew, let alone a Roman, uh, would be considered a breach of the Jewish law because the Jews were meant to be like holy and set apart. And God in the Old Testament talks a lot about like not mixing people. Um, It got to the point where if a Jew married a Gentile, um, they would have a funeral for the Jew because he was no longer a part of God's people, even though he didn't die. It was very fascinating. So Peter just kind of agrees. He's like, yeah, I'll go with you guys, Gentiles, and this Cornelius who has summoned me. Um, That was a fun noise. Um, Okay. The other thing is that he's going to Caesarea, Caesarea, it says right at the start, right? Cornelius is in Caesarea. That was pretty much the Roman capital of Israel at this point. Um, it was like the closest, is the like northern point, um, and all the like higher, the upper echelons of military power in the area were in Caesarea. It's pretty much like a headquarters for Roman soldiers in the area. So while there are Jews in the city, because it's still... It's pretty much a Jewish country. Rome is in power, and that means pagan culture is everywhere. There's statues to gods, 
and Caesar, and just really reminders to the people everywhere who's in charge and whose gods are in charge. Um, And the people who are in charge are the people who have oppressed and enslaved Peter's friends and his people for years. That's the culture that Cornelius most likely grew up in, and that's where Peter's going. However, Cornelius knew something. He knew that the Jews were not allowed to enter the home of a Gentile, most likely when someone told him about God. Um, It's mostly because of the same unclean food laws that they can't enter the house of a Gentile. But um, he knew this. So why is, why is Peter going there? Cornelius knows this. Peter knows this. Why is he going there? Why did Peter go? I'm going to tell a story of when I was somewhere that I should not have been, and God used that to show me something. Um, myself and two of my friends, Logan and Travis. Travis, um, it could have been, it could be any number of stories with me, Logan, and Travis, honestly. Um, Travis also works for UCO here. Logan works for UCO down in Huntington in Indiana. It was about two years ago. We went on a trip out to Colorado. Beautiful place. Got into our Airbnb. The, the Airbnb is a whole other story. Um, this piece of house story, if you want it. But we wanted to see what Colorado had to, had to offer, right? I missed Lansing, Michigan, very flat. I could see, back home in Dublin, I could see the mountains from my front yard. It's beautiful. I love the mountains. And we had our sights set on Mount Bierstadt, one of the several 14ers in the Rockies. Uh, the 14, a 14er is, the peak is 14,000 feet above sea level. High. The, Denver is a mile high city, so yeah, but you're still climbing a lot. Um, so this is, this is where we were. There's Logan with the backpack and then Travis right in front of him. Um, at this point, I had had COVID twice, and I smoked cigarettes for like five years. Um, so <laughs> we had gotten in the night before. It's a great start, right? So we'd gotten in the night before, and they say give yourself like 24 hours at least to adjust to the altitude. No one had told us that. So we decided to go for it the next morning, right? Um, we were getting up the slope, and this is, this is the mountain. So, if, so that right there is the peak, and so we got to go up a bunch of these switchbacks, right? Um, it's beautiful, right? And so we're, we're doing it. I'm dying, I'm seeing spots after like two hours, right? But I'm, I'm on a mission. We're going to do this thing. So after a few hours, we get up to the ridge, right? Like just over here, we're past the edge of the photo. Um, there's like a little ridge before you start going up this part to get to the peak, right? So we got up here, and we look around. We look behind us. There's a little, little stormy cloud guy. Um, <laughs> down in the valley, and I'm like, well, Travis doesn't want to keep going, Logan's like, we have to keep going, I'm dying again, um, but hey, we've come this far, we, we don't know how fast storms travel, how far away it is, we're from the city, we don't know these things, so we decide to go for it, um, and it's tough climbing, this last part um, it's like a lot of boulders and rocks and things like that. Um, but we really wanted to be able to say we climbed a 14er, right? Um, and I take a step up onto this boulder, um, like this, and I like, I'm about to lose my balance, so I did one of these things, and I'm fine, right? I get my balance. But while I put my hand up, it felt weird, and it made a weird noise. And so I did it again. I went like this. And from like here up, my hand starts to buzz with static electricity. And so I look around. A little little stormy guy from down in the valley is coming at us fast. And so I yell at the guys. I'm like, hey, put your hands in the air. And Travis is like, what? (laughs) 
<laughs> he's like, what? And so I'm like, the storm's coming. He's, Travis goes like this. <laughs> and he feels it. He's a little ahead of me, naturally, because I'm dying. And he feels it, and he looks at me. And we realize we should not be here. So we turned around and just start sprinting. I don't know where my, I'm not sure how my lungs didn't explode. We were going, I was, I was clocking fast time, okay? <laughs> While we, so we're jumping down these boulders. We're, we're really running for our lives. I thought, if not me, one of the three of us was going to die. Um, a lightning bolt hits in the valley past the mountain, like probably like a hundred, like like eighty yards from us, um, as we're sprinting. And uh, we ran, we ran for. I was hard to know how long it was. We ran until like we felt a lot of the static kind of fade, and the animals had stopped like running around. There's <laughs> there's these things called marmots up there. We called them chimichangas because we didn't know what they were. Um, they, they saw us running. They saw us walking up there, and they were, like, running around. We were like, that's so cool. And then they, were, they saw us running, and they were like, I felt like they were cheering us on. They were like, go, oh, get out of here. And so uh, they would stopped running around and freaking out. Something I found out later, um, it's, it's widely known that the storms – roll onto the mountains from about noon onwards. We started climbing at 11.30. <laughs> um, but we got into the car when we got down, and, and we worshipped. We worshipped the Lord for like a good 20 minutes on the car ride back because the three of us, we were somewhere that we just should not have been. And, and the Lord saved us. He showed us through that, that he loved us, that he wasn't calling us home just yet, and he had more stuff that he wanted us to do here. And I've remembered that for a long time. Um, I think about it a decent amount, because um, I just should not have been there. And, and the Lord will use us being in places that we shouldn't be to show us something, to teach us something, to help us again and again. Peter, in our story, was definitely somewhere that he should not have been because the Lord had already shown him something to lead him there, and he used it to show Peter and everyone else something even better. Okay, let's keep reading. <clears throat> so when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So not... When I was sent for, I came without objection. I ask you then why you sent for me. So because of the vision that Peter had, he understood that God was leading him not to see the people he met as unclean or unworthy of Peter's presence or ministry, right? Cornelius tries to worship Peter. It's like the first verse on the screen. Peter telling Cornelius to stand up tells us, Um, that Peter sees himself and Cornelius really as equals, as people, humans, sinners before God, both men in the same standing despite the colossal amount of differences between the two men, right? Peter already shows us as soon as he steps into the home, which he he shouldn't have been there already, um, that he understands what the Lord is trying to show him that they're both men and the only one worthy of worship in the way that Cornelius showed is Jesus, the Son of God. He's the only one worthy of worship. So Cornelius explains his vision to Peter and he says, 
Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. He pretty much gives Peter free reign to speak for him, to speak to him and his friends and relatives. He gathered a lot of people that he knew, that he was related to, to this one place to hear Peter speak. Because he trusts that it's God that's brought him to this place. <clears throat> So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened to him throughout Judea. Beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that, all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter preaches the gospel to this huge group of Romans, the people who invaded his homeland. They had killed his people. They sieged the temple where he went to worship God. The son of God, Peter's God, they crucified his best friend, the one who came to save the world. They were the authority that condemned him to death. They put him to death on a cross less than 10 years before this conversation happened. And God orchestrates this whole thing, this whole thing across. He must, they walked for a whole day to show Peter, the leader of the church at that point, that the gospel is meant for everybody. He says, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. There's a place in the church for everyone, that no matter what color you are, where you come from, what you've done, good or bad, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. And it's not just, it's not just for you to hear, but that God loves you and you can live in that. Each and every single one of us, Peter tells us definitively that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we need a Savior, and that if you have faith in him, your sins are forgiven, and you have eternal life with him. Amen? Amen. After Peter finishes speaking, the people gathered there, they start worshiping the Lord, because while he was speaking, they believed what he said. In their hearts, they accepted the truth of what Peter was saying. They made it their own. They chose to live it for themselves. They received the Holy Spirit the same way that the apostles did at Pentecost, and and it looked the same. And Peter's friends are shocked. Peter's Jewish friends who he brought with him, they're shocked because they know what it means. It means that when Jesus, after he'd been raised from the dead, told the apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, Jesus meant it. The apostles had been to Jerusalem. They'd been to Judea. They'd been to Samaria. And God was showing them, you're taking it to the ends of the earth. My gospel is for everyone. There is no prerequisite to belief in Jesus Christ. When we repent, turn away from sin, and trust in Jesus... We are rescued from sin and death. Amen? Amen. Those people that Peter talked to, they were soldiers. Soldiers kill people. 
They, could have, they were murderers. And he brought Peter from so far away. God brought people, Peter from so far away. He gave them both visions, brought them together to rescue those people. But Jesus came even further. He came from heaven with his father to us to take on flesh as a human and got up on that cross. He should not have been there. He should not have been there, but he had to. And he took our sins because he loved us. He, he saved those Roman soldiers because he loved them. And he saved you. The thing that is true for Cornelius and his people then is still true today. That whether you grow up knowing who Jesus is or not, no matter where you're from, what you've done, good or bad, God knows all of it. And he's still waiting for you to come and choose for him. He will never count you out of the saving grace of his gospel. Worship team, why don't you come back up? The choice that, that Cornelius and, um, and his friends made while Peter was speaking, that choice is, is here for you guys tonight. If you've been living for a culture that is far from God, <clears throat> if you think you're, you're not worthy or you don't need Jesus, if you've been the soldier fighting against Christians, whatever that might look like today. Let us pray for you. Decide. Come decide and trust him. We'll have people at the back who will pray with you. I'll head back after I finish. You don't need anything or to be anything. All you need is a willing heart to come and put trust in him. a heart that wants to live for God. Even if you don't know how or what it looks like. And if you've been living for God for a while, take this time to come back to him. Trust in him again. Give him the parts of your life where you aren't living for him. Or if you want to be like Jesus, like Peter, who steps into the places that maybe you shouldn't, want, you shouldn't be. Maybe you don't want to be. The bold places where, where maybe even we would tell you, maybe, maybe don't go there. Maybe, maybe it's not safe to go there to preach the gospel. If that's the kind of boldness that you want, let us pray with you. So we'll take some time to worship and respond, but take the opportunity you have here. Come back to the Lord.